I wanted to start by saying that we are all designers, urban designers, and we design things, but the most exciting thing to design is your life, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. And uh, we're talking about how we don't make a master plan for life because master plans are static, as we say in the studio. And we create a strategic plan. So that's like more algorithms. If this, then I can do that. If that, I can do this. Uh, so they're very dynamic and they uh, let you take a lot of opportunities. Uh, so uh, I'll, everyone in this call is really successful, which is why you are here on the call. So we know that you know how to succeed, which is great. But I just want to underline that um, that in all this uh, master plan, uh, uh, strategic planning uh, exercise, what, what's really important to keep in mind is what are your values? And when you look back 10 years on your life, will you be able to say that I designed my life in sync with my values? So I think that's like super interesting. Uh, so I'm going to, um, Emily is also here, welcome Emily. I'm going to let Kaya talk about the, um, the rules of this event. Kaya, please. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. So excited to see so many faces. Um, and, and thanks to this situation, faces from all over the world, um, including our panelists, who some of, you know, for some of them it's late at night. Um, a few quick rules. So Sushmita and Joy have collected presentations and will, for the most part, um, air their screen and steer sort of the visuals um, for these short presentations. Anyone who has a question for the speakers, uh, type them in the chat. Um, and at the end, we'll do two panels, um, three speakers now, and then the sec then a, a short Q&A, where we will ask um, I, we, Gita and I, we will read the questions and then we will ask you to ask your question um, and let the speakers respond. Um, and then we do the same thing again with the second panel. We've also prepared little breakout rooms for the end. We're trying to make this as close to a real event as possible. So after the formal part of this is over, you can go to any of the breakout rooms and continue conversations with uh, the speakers, with us, with each other um, for a little bit longer informally. You have to grab your own drink. No wine provided by GSAP today. Um, but hopefully this will be fun and very informative about you know, many different ways to think about the next steps after graduating and the places where you all may end up you know, next month, uh, next year, 10 years from now, um, if you know, that's sort of the range of some of our speakers. So with that, I want to hand it over to Emily and all the speakers. We ask you to introduce yourself. We will just sort of quickly say your name. And Emily is actually one of the few speakers who is from New York, in New York. You're there. Great. Yep. Great. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, yeah, so my name is Emily Weidenhoff, and I work at the Department of Transportation in New York City. Um, and I just want to share a few um, quick slides to start um, to talk a little bit about um, what I think is uh, certainly so important about the, the field of urban design, but has also been, I've found critical to um, uh, kind of creating um, your own path. And certainly um, I graduated uh, in a recession, nothing, nothing even close to obviously what, what we're dealing with now. Um, but certainly I think um, recognizing resources and understanding um, what we have to work with and what we can do with them is um, immensely important to the work that we do and to um, creating really um, powerful outcomes on the ground for people. Um, am I advancing the slides or am I gonna? Okay, great. Um, so uh, when, when I graduated, I um, made a very um, kind of concerted um, uh, 
uh, goal for myself not to go back into the architecture field. I had an undergraduate degree in architecture and I really went into urban design um, with a keen interest in, um, as I like to say, uh, continuing to salmon upstream uh, up the decision tree to get to a place where um, uh, you know, my thoughts and ideas were um, uh, better uh, impacting outcomes. And so I went from, you know, feeling frustrated with designing uh, bathrooms um, and, and apartments for rich people to, um, you know, entering the um, amazingly um, powerful and thoughtful dialogue at Columbia and in the urban design program where we were talking about a much more um, sophisticated set of issues that impacted um, so many more people um, and we really were looking at um, at the larger systems and so um, what um, you know what really drove me um, after graduating is really trying to figure out who was actually doing something who was actually making a change um, in in New York City and I went um, and worked for a, a couple different folks before um, at the time um, in 2009 I found um, the Department of Transportation um, and one of kind of the the um, founding motivations for all the work that under Mayor Bloomberg and our former commissioner Jeanette Sadek Khan um, uh, the it was the realization of streets as a resource. Um, the streets in New York City make up a little over a quarter of um, all land area, and um, it makes the commissioner of the Department of Transportation the largest single property holder in all of the city. And so with that realization of streets as a resource and with recognizing that they had been over-designed for vehicles for so many years and our streets had um, so much more capacity to be redesigned and thought of um, for people, for people on bikes, um, for communities, um, that triggered a, a really amazing set of information um, uh, implementation, a lot of rapid response um, projects that were really able to change the landscape of New York City over the past decade. And so really quickly, just want to run through a few of our programs, which have continued to evolve. And I think I um, um, could just go through the slides. Um, looking at, um, you know, we continuously look at how we can change um, our streets to meet the needs of the people who actually live in the city. So this is our weekend walk program where we look at pedestrianizing um, long corridors through neighborhoods um, when vehicle volumes are low to really um, bring out all of the kind of social and cultural infrastructure that's happening um, in buildings in neighborhoods and bring it out onto the street and make it a resource for everybody. Um, next slide. Um, this is our seasonal street program, which kind of kicks up, um, kicks the weekend walk program up a notch and is our attempt to, um, in a more uh, more robust way, not just a couple days on the weekend, but for a, a series of months or, um, you know, during, uh, for half the year, every single day time, really transforming streets and in a more precise way, managing our resources for the majority of users. We see so many of our streets, um, the majority of people on our streets in the daytime are pedestrians. And so how can we better um, design our, our resources for, for who is actually using them? Next slide. Um, this is a, another evolved uh, program over the years, but rethinking um, the parking lanes, certainly something that many cities have been doing for, for a long time and something we continue to push and, and evolve in our, um, in our work and starting to think about not just a couple seats in front of a restaurant, but how we can repurpose a parking lane for parking for people, for parking for bicyclists um, uh, along a much larger scale. Um, corridor long impacts that also help um, not only with facilitating, um, you know, biking and, and people gathering, but also making our streets safer, slowing vehicles, creating sort of slower crossing distances, things like that. Uh, next slide. 
um, shared streets, which is something that um, has been working well in, in many countries uh, for a very long time. But over the past couple of years, we've finally uh, been able to uh, turn our engineers um, and our um, the, the larger public around into giving um, uh, you know, giving our streets a more flexible design that allows pedestrians a lot more um, ability and flexibility to use um, the street, as well as really creating designs that really slow vehicles down and keep um, both vehicles unintentionally and intentionally um, creating spaces where it's much harder um, for, for crashes because of uh, better design for pedestrians. Uh, next slide. And then also I'm um, continuing to um, kind of entirely transform roadbed into space for people and really looking and targeting um, the spaces and communities throughout New York City that need these resources the most. Um, over the past many years, we have really worked to retool our programs and advocate for funding so that we're able to deliver kind of what you see in Times Square. We're able to deliver um, these types of quality of life uh, amenities to, um, uh, to neighborhoods who don't necessarily have the institutional capacity to take care of them. Um, this is a, a photo of a plaza in Jackson Heights. Um, and last slide. Um, everything I just showed you uh, is totally um, up in the air right now because we all can't be together. So everything that I do and so much of what New York City streets are about, um, we haven't been able to um, uh, um, kind of connect because of that. But what I have learned through doing um, this work, uh, making real change in real communities on the street, um, trying to get it out there quickly, learn from it and evolve, not kind of have something perfect uh, in the beginning, but um, just continue to iterate. Um, we've seen over time that um, crisis, while, um, you know, an incredibly, um, uh, kind of serious and profound time for people who are experiencing um, major losses for people who have radically transformed their lives to help try to save others. Um, there's also an amazing opportunity. Um, certainly as urban designers, we think every day about ways we can redesign our cities and um, have great ideas. And, and one of the biggest challenges is convincing others that um, change is good, that our, our ideas actually will, will make a better city. And so we are at a moment um, moments I've seen on smaller scales before in the city where we have a, a global community that um, is starting to internalize and understand that um, we can't go back to the way things were before. And so there's a huge opportunity as um, you all think about your steps and, and the future of our cities globally. Um, there is a real opportunity. People are listening. People are understanding. People are looking for solutions. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that all of you have, have amazing ideas. Um, and so I think um, while now is an incredibly um, sobering time, it's also a, a, a tremendous moment of hope um, and a real, um, a, a real moment to embrace the kind of um, creativity that I know you all have um, and, and use that to guide your next steps. Thank you, Emily. That was wonderful. Um, and next up is Mansi Sahu, who joins us from Mumbai. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mansi. Um, I, um, I'm a graduate from Columbia. I graduated in 2011 and uh, moved back to India in, by the end of 2011. Um, should I share my screen? Oh, yeah, there it is. So um, this is just a graphic that I truly love that somebody from my office did for a project that we did for Dal Lake in Srinagar. Um, if you can go next, please. Uh, so I'm sure there are a lot of questions in your head. When I graduated, I think the biggest question was because I fell in love with urban design while I was studying and all the different ideas and different ways of practicing urban design 
were so overwhelming that I constantly talked to myself and wondered how am I going to practice urban design when I go out. And um, you know, looking back at the last nine years, uh, I think it has been uh, truly uh, amazing because I think that question has always uh, made me do more. Uh, and even today, I keep asking myself the same thing. So I, I was in New York uh, at the time when jobs were uh, especially not there for immigrants and people who are coming and needed visas. Uh, but at the same time, I was working with Earth Institute and I got an opportunity to work for the Millennium Cities Initiative in Accra. And when I went to Accra and started working with the mayor of Accra, I realized the amount of capacity building that you can do as an urban designer working with the government, especially of developing countries. And coming from India, I knew how much urban design and urban planning is required. So I, I don't think I spent too much time, but I decided to go back uh, to Mumbai. I found these two brilliant partners of mine because I don't think I could have survived this journey alone. Um, I worked with an architect and when I came back, I realized there were different kind of organizations in Mumbai, but there was no pure urban design organization. It was always an interior organization that also had urban designers or an architecture organization that also had urban designers. And what we really wanted to do was really take up and even our planning offices are full of engineers and nothing against engineers, but there's no mix in diversity. So we realized that there is definitely a need for a pure urban design practice. And uh, in seven years, uh, I would just like to say these amazing faces that are there on the screen are the faces of my studio today. And they represent different universities from the world. They've all come back and joined a firm that is purely uh, trying to do urban design in India. If you could go next, please. So there are different questions that are there in everybody's mind. How do I get a project? How do I start a practice? How, do, how does one, do I need to network? Do I need to have no people to get projects? And I just like to share this story with you for a project that's very close to my heart. Uh, this, is, uh, for us, uh, this is a heritage urban design toolkit that we did for the government of India. Uh, the lead was TRCI India. It's a heritage conservation firm. And uh, the head of that firm, um, Gurmeet Rai, uh, is an amazing uh, woman that I met at a, at a conference. And, um, and I had just started uh, Studio Pod. It was, we were a year old. We had done a couple of documents and we really wanted to work on a heritage city like Puri because it is, someday if I have more time, I'll show you this project but uh, it's uh, one of the four pilgrim sites for Hindus in India and the idea was to create a conservation plan. Uh, a lot of uh, champions of different cities chose buildings to conserve and Gurmeet uh, chose the city as, as the site and decided to create zones and each zone had a toolkit that was talking about the pressures that, that urbanization was putting on the heritage city and how the city must develop uh, and what are the kind of guidelines that no matter if you're doing an interior project or a house renovation or if you're doing an infrastructure project, how do these guidelines remain the same? And I met her at a conference and I introduced the form and I said, please give me any work. And if you pay me, I would love to do any kind of urban design because I know you cannot do this without an urban designer and I know you don't have an urban designer on your team. And that was something that I was just bluffing, but really she didn't have an urban designer on her team. And um, I think after stalking her for about a month, she called me back and said, okay, I would like to work with you on the urban design toolkit. So why don't you have exactly a month? Because I'm short staffed and if you have a firm, then you have, a, you have a month to make this 500 page toolkit for us. So if you're up for it, then let me know. And because we were so excited, we were like, yes, for sure. One month is fine, we'll, we'll be able to do this. And in a month, uh, we were able to produce a toolkit, which I'm very proud of. Um, 
it is definitely one of the uh, documents that a lot of people have come back to me and said they thoroughly like the way the approach uh, a very academic and professional approach that we took uh, it is also selected for the ibr biennale for rotterdam this year so it will be presented there as well and a lot of work on ground is also going on since the past 6 years using the toolkit so this project is very close to me because i feel like uh, this saying which is down there uh, that if they don't give you a seat at the table bring a folding chair is exactly the kind of approach that you need every you know like as urban designers i'm sure anything you touch which represents humans you can definitely have a say and you can definitely make it better so you know don't don't think that oh i only need a job in an architectural firm or i you can work anywhere from streets to furniture to interiors and if your base of urban design is good i'm sure you'll make it better so this is just something that i carry with myself in every project that i i pitch for is that no matter how big the project or how small you need an urban designer on the team and i'm the urban designer you want so if you can go to the next slide please um this was uh, this was also a very amazing project for us i think uh, in in urban design they teach you collaboration is key and you know no no urban designer can work without collaboration i don't know if you realize yet but collaboration is the most difficult thing you will do in your life or at least it has been the most difficult thing for me because it might sound easy but it's like a very difficult rela relationship that continuously needs uh communication and if you do it right then you you get a good product but um is definitely something that the firm is doing with different people so this project came to us because we have a uh, great collaborators um who we are working with on and off they're actually a finance company they only work with numbers they are all mba graduates and they only work on excel sheets and uh, they came to us with this project and said that there is something called non fair box revenue plan and this plan needs an architect and i know you're an architect so can you work with us because we're going to work with the metro line of mumbai and they want to in they have taken a lot of loan from the world bank and they have to make a revenue plan in order to get enough revenue which is not from the ticketing but from everything else so from the land that they have or from uh the kind of footfalls that they can get a kind of retail that they can make in their concourse all of that contributes to that revenue and can you work with us and can you find the best places to put the advertisements for us and that's that's your scope so we said okay sure it doesn't sound like an urban design plan but if it's you know if it's got something to do with the metros we'd love to be involved so we started working with them and i think in the past one and a half years that we've been working with them we have managed to change the station designs uh to make the make it more accessible to commuters we have managed to tell them what is the kind of good integrated planning that they can do uh for the excess land they had that they have acquired for their stations we have managed to uh reduce the amount of uh unusable concourse area that they had planned as just as areas that were uh, you know in an architectural plan somewhere in the corner and through this and with good collaborators we could show them how good urban design can also be profitable can also be integrated can also be something that will increase the amount of footfall and we gave birth to something that is really big in mumbai right now it's called direct access because all the metros are above ground and they're really high uh and um, so they are starting to talk about how do um plots that are adjacent to the metro take maximum advantage of this and we've also managed to start conversations about tod policies so just when they got us in for uh, putting um, advertisements we ended up doing so much for them and uh, through the process they were able to claim 15% of the revenues uh through non fair box through good planning and numbers so it was a very good learning for us uh, where key collaborations work 
So if you can go next, please. So that's another learning that I've had is that collaboration is key. Um, the private sector. This is something very interesting and I'd like to talk about this. Um, in, um, in India, if you're working uh, for the private sector, it's considered like the devil. So if you work for them, you've kind of sold your soul. And you know, if you're working for an NGO, then you know, you're a saint. Um, but I think, um, and at the same time, in India, we have always given planning for free. A lot of our senior architects, um, a lot of the very renowned architects in India usually give planning for free with architecture. So it's included in their fee. So one of the biggest struggles that we've had is to actually create a scope of work for urban design, for an urban design consultancy firm, especially in the private sector, because they're so used to getting it for free. Uh, and for the government, it ends up becoming a pro bono effort from some big architect uh, that is doing it as a pro bono effort from the community. So the, again, they're not used to paying for it. Um, so in the private sector, we've realized that uh, we're working on a couple of master plans for Godrej properties. And we've realized that we were able to crack the perfect urban block with all the constraints that they have, with all the efficiencies that they need to uh, kind of achieve. Uh, it's just the fact that we were there and we could constantly push back and say, you know, if you break the grid, it will be walkable. If you create a front, sorry, if you create a front plaza, then you're going to have a good uh, visibility and more people are going to come here and it's going to be more livable and more children will play and very simple and common sense things that urban, urban designers say that somewhere get lost between efficiency and numbers and all the other things that they're so used to talking about. Uh, so that's something that we've done and we worked on multiple master plans for different townships. We've created wayfinding strategies. Uh, they've kind of pushed us towards landscape urbanism right now. Yes, yes. And also, uh, if you go to the last slide, uh, the other things we've also done is we have created different initiatives. Uh, a Portland initiative is something Geeta has been a part of since the day we started it. Uh, and we've also started something called Bridge, where we are talking to the youngest stakeholders of our city and trying to see what their aspirations are. So these are some things that we do that actually help us connect and uh, with and also talk through different exhibition stations, design charrettes and stuff. So it's really a mixed bag that I have, uh, the kind of practice that I have, but the core has always been urban design. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mansi. Um, and we'll go right up to the next person, Milton Garavito. He graduated a year before Mansi, is originally from Colombia and joins us from the West Coast. Thank you, thank you, Kaya. Uh, so you can go to the first slide. Uh, are you going to be sharing the screen or? Oh, there you go. Uh, so I did my undergrad in Colombia and I worked for the city government for the Department of the Advocacy for Public Space in Bogota. That was during the first administration of the former mayor, uh, Enrique Peñalosa. And then I came to California and I worked for this joint venture at the time between the Guerrera and London Wilson International. And then I went to the graduate program in Urban Design at Columbia. That was in 2010. Uh, and after graduation, my practice has been pretty much between, I mean, between my solo practice and working for other architects, uh, and also between architecture and urban planning and design. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And then uh, in my solo practice, that was in 2012, I designed this uh, a unit apartment building in Koreatown in LA. Consultants were both in, in LA and Bogota City. Uh, and then in collaboration with other architects, uh, Piroda Design Group, uh, we designed this commercial development project in Hawaii. The design intent was to be a site zero net energy by using solar panels in the parking area uh, to power the, the entire commercial complex. And after the approved entitlements at the city planning in Hawaii, and then after the design development uh, stage, the project was nominated for the North American Design and Development and Rebuild Awards. 
by the International Council of Shopping Centers. It wasn't built at the end <laughs> for budget issues, but uh, by the property group, the owner here in LA. But uh, it was nice to learn about the vernacular architecture in, in Hawaii, uh, the opportunity to apply green blended practices with a sustainable side. That, that was a nice experience. Uh, the next slide. And then also with Pirona, we worked on this uh, pavilion for the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. Uh, at the time, the LA Zoo had the support of the National Geographic and the plan was to, and also the Worldwide Fund, uh, the plan was to have the admission fee at the pavilion where people could learn about the giant panda to provide support uh, to the giant panda conservation programs in, in Asia. Uh, so that was a beautiful experience working in this uh, pavilion at the LA Zoo. And then I worked for Robert Heidi Architects uh, in, multi in um, low density housing. This master plan in Orange County. Uh, and I think I could share this experience with Dr. Professor Gita just a couple of weeks ago that lessons learned about these low density housing projects in, in California, in pretty much in the US. I believe it's something that needs to be revised. You know, the, the index use uh, for low density housing, which is four and five units per acre. I think it's, not, it's something that needs to be revised and changed in suburban areas in, in the US. Because I, I, my personal experience was shocking to see this, uh, this market, low density housing, you know, for wealthy families in, 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 in Southern California. And again, other parts of the US, uh, it's something that doesn't really contribute to the environment and increasing the footprint and, you know, and empty lands in, in, in many places. I believe, again, it's something that needs to be just revised, you know, for, for suburban area. Um, next slide. And then uh, in 2018, I became more active with the LA, the AIALA uh, in the urban design review sessions. Basically, the Los Angeles Department of City Planning were welcoming architects and urban designers to volunteer and provide feedback uh, or comments for the coming projects located around the city. So uh, early last year, I joined also the, I had the opportunity to join this uh, group of architects who were also commenting and providing feedback for the new version of the citywide uh, design guidelines. The objective was to not only be a communication, uh, sorry, an organization tool for the Department of City Planning, but also a communication tool uh, uh, with developers, you know, with specific and critical, top critical topics for, for the city of Los Angeles. Mainly, the, there were three approaches established by the Department of City Planning, which was uh, to have pedestrian-oriented neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Uh, to have developments that consider and respect the surrounding context through a 360 degree design and also developments that apply green building practices and just simply promote healthy habitats, healthy neighborhoods through a climate adaptive design. Those uh, design guidelines became effective last year in October in, in 2018 and they, are being, they have been used uh, uh, during the design review sessions, which is again, I have the opportunity to attend once a month. Uh, well, now lately it's online also those <laughs> with one design review session. And then uh, also in 2018, next slide, uh, with my thesis partners uh, from Columbia, well, first of all, we became very good friends after the program. Uh, Pedro, who was in New York and moved to Denmark over a year ago, uh, Manny Barrios, uh, he's uh, originally from Mexico City, and uh, he is also here in LA. We started this conversation of a consulting group. Um, I think pieces came together uh, at the right moment with the right people. Uh, so not only you know my Columbia colleagues, but also close friends in Colombia and other disciplines. Uh, we we started this conversation of having, of having a global consulting group, a global collective action initiative for sustainability. And uh, we noticed that there were some topics that we have in common in our professional practice. Uh, the common denominator really just addressing and mitigating all the effects of climate change. That, that was pretty much the, what we found in common, obviously. Uh, and by joining efforts and expertise, we came up with this idea of having an interdisciplinary group 
you know, sharing the same passion for, for, for sustainability, uh, for promoting, promoting sustainable developments. So our goal is to integrate the practices of sustainability through design, planning, and management. Uh, uh, three dimensions that we, you know, we, we think can, you know, we can promote sustainable developments. Um, so based on our expertise and our backgrounds, again, with my thesis partners, the work experience that Pedro had in York, Manny here in LA, and my friends in Colombia, we established these three working areas, which is this integrated regional management, urban design strategies, and collective impact. Collective impact refers to social integration projects uh, uh, for co sustainable communities. Um, we are currently consulting in Colombia with the Inter-American Development Bank for the Emerging Cities Program, phase two, which is the diagnostic phase of, of the program. Um, here in the US, uh, we moved from a consulting group to a nonprofit to, to find sources. It would be easier to reach out to philanthropists or groups to fund a research projects and the think tank. Um, we are still just brainstorming, you know, generating ideas about and models. Uh, we are working in this model for the controlled urban growth in the emerging cities, specifically in rural and conurbation areas in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we are also brainstorming, you know, and creating ideas uh, about a regulatory scheme for the urban design and the economic use of public space in Bogota. This refers to the fact that there's a lot of immigrants from Venezuela moving to Colombia in the last few years. And uh, not only unemployment is becoming an issue, but also public space. So we are create, you know, working in a model that is not only the design component, which is the urban design strategy, but also a business model. Either because it's private fund or public fund or both. Uh, based on my friend's experience, we know that the business model, I think, is what's going to need the design. Uh, we are looking forward to partner with some uh, nonprofits in Europe. Pedro is working on that. Uh, there are some organizations with experience in pedestrian fair design and inter integrated regional management, uh, topics like circular economy, industrial symbiosis, etc. Uh, we are looking forward to partner with them to bring that experience to South America. Uh, and then with this, you know, with this crisis, we believe there is a lot of potential too, you know, in terms of uh, the, poly, the urban real and, and the and sustainable developments. I think we see a lot of opportunities from, from there. And that's it. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat and um, that's okay because we're kind of um, very tight on time, but that's also just means please do start writing up your questions for a Q&A session at the end for all of the panelists, because um, not talking and not asking questions is definitely not the right way to go in, in sort of finding out what to do next. Um, but I wanna hand it over to the next three speakers and Gita will introduce them. And in the meantime, Please don't be shy to fill the chat with additional ideas or questions, everyone. Thank you. So let's uh, welcome now uh, Ban, uh, who graduated in uh, 2018 and is joining us from Nairobi. And going, she's going to talk about her work with you and Habitat. Ban. Thanks, Gita. Uh, so yeah, as as Gita said, my name is Ban. I'm from Jordan. I'm Currently an urban planner working with UN Habitat based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I'll give a bit of introduction about myself to uh, just to give you a bit of background. So before my master's, I started, I studied architecture in the UK and I worked a bit there on the private sector. And I also had the same feelings that I did not want to go back to working in a corporate private sector environment. I felt I wanted to be more engaged within governments and with the governments. And um, I also um, kind of picked up a few skills in urban design and the program that I felt like um, are worth and more important, more valuable for me to look into, such as more, I, I felt like I was more of an analytical person. I had stronger analytical skills and conceptualizing ideas and design and uh, having background research to support that. So I knew that I wanted to do something more in a, a larger scale. 
And um, funny enough, at that time, one of the alumni from the program, which taught you in the summer, Carmelo, had just joined and moved to Nairobi to work at UN Habitat for a few months. So um, he came back once and uh, we, um, we spoke and he said, I think you'll really like UN Habitat and you'll really fit in there. Um, and then I tried and I applied and I've been so far with them for two years and I'll explain to you a bit of what UN Habitat does and the kind of work that I do with them right now. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard already about the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, which are goals that have been agreed on by member states and countries uh, to achieve within 20, uh, by, by 2030. And I'd like to focus particularly on SDG number 11, which is on making sustainable cities and communities inclusive and leaving no one behind. Um, as UN Habitat, that's part, that's uh, our mandate. We are the custodians of SDG number 11, ensuring that um, all cities and communities are sustainable and inclusive, well-planned and well-designed and managed. Um, to do that, we, uh, UN Habitat started in 1978 through a Habitat Convention. Uh, and then that recently happened in 2016 in Quito, in Ecuador. And they released this document called the New Urban Agenda, which is a document uh, to explain how cities can be well-planned, well-managed for better urbanization, especially putting more and more emphasis on the fact that the world is becoming more and more urban. Um, recently, we had a restructuring and they had a new strategic plan. So our focus mostly on is on... Um, reducing spatial inequality and poverty, enhancing shared prosperity of cities and region, strengthening climate action, as well as uh, effective urban crisis and response. And we do that through also addressing cross-cutting issues, ensuring uh, human rights are addressed, uh, children, youth, and older persons are included throughout, the, including gender inclusiveness, as well as disability. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we, uh, as I said earlier, we, the headquarters are based in Nairobi, where most of the employees are based there. And then we have country offices in each, uh, in many of the member states that we work with, where there are smaller teams. But all, most of the work, so the work is a mix of um, operational work that's on the ground, as well as normative, where we write publications based on what we have developed uh, and explored on the ground. So there are regions and there are different country offices as well as the headquarters and they collaborate to mo work mostly on different themes of work. So mostly on plan uh, planning, finance and economy, housing, land and shelter, um, urban basic services, but also looking at, as I said, finance, legislation, uh, mobility and uh, social inclusion for those. So as I said, it's a mix of both on the ground and operational. And if you go to the next slide, um, I am in a, currently in a section called the Planning, Finance and Economy section within a section that is called the Urban Planning and Design Lab. The Urban Planning and Design Lab is more of an integrative facility within UN Habitat where we work mostly with cities, the private sector, NGOs, and try to um, collaborate and as well as with donors to link them together and uh, develop different profiles and analyses of cities to recommend projects and to recommend what needs to be done. So I was particularly, um, when I joined, I particularly started working on this project funded by the UK government called the Prosperity Fund Global Future Cities Programme. And the programme works in 19 cities globally to ensure that cities are inclusive and um, pros uh, pro increase prosperity while also improving business trade between the UK and these cities. But the focus of the projects are mostly on urban planning, transportation, and resilience. So the projects vary in scale and in, um, in range, but what we had to do in the beginning is to analyze these cities, see how they grow, what the different patterns are, considering mobility, resilience, um, urban planning, the growth of the city, the population, but also look into governance structures and how to engage these stakeholders. So how is, um, how is the city organized? Who has the most authority? How do they deal with stakeholders? How is the planning happening? Are they collaborating together? Are they sharing data? And all of that we've written into reports to develop these city context reports or urban profiles that we do and then uh, recommend projects. So for example, I worked on Bangkok and we had three different projects. One is dealing with developing a transit oriented development plan to mix transit urban planning, but also looking into resilience because it was in a, in a flooding area. 
We also had a project on developing a data hub for the city and another one for developing a decision support system for the floods that take place there. We, we also work in cities such as in Turkey where we develop a master plan for non-motorized transport and um, so as that. Uh, these were all developed, um, they were finalized last year and then the UK government sent them out for bidding um, last year around this time and then now the private sector is on board. So our role mostly is to see their work, to monitor it, is it in line with the work that we do? Are they including gender? Are they including social inclusion? Are they considering issues of how the project can continue in the long term? And um, we do that all through engaging the stakeholders. So if you go to the next slide, what we have done um, in the past, actually two months ago, right before all of this happened, um, I, was, I was traveling to Myanmar, Vietnam and Indonesia to go and have workshops with the cities to uh, discuss with them what their challenges are, what the opportunities that they see within the projects, what they think that the, the private sector should prioritize and take into account that they have not taken. And even through all of this, um, we've engaged civil society, we've engaged academia to also see what are the current trends that are going on the ground and how to best ensure that they are um, achieved through the projects that we have. So this is a bit of what we work on the ground and how to uh, implement it. And then based on also the problems that we see within the cities or common themes, we also um, write reports on them. So currently we are looking at drafting reports based on the cities that we have, in particular one on smart cities and the use of data in cities and one on financing, because that's a huge issue for many of the cities on how to implement such projects. And uh, another one on ensuring resilience within design of projects to ensure that it is taken into account considering the crisis that we're going through right now, but also other environmental and natural disasters. Uh, and then finally, if you go to the last slide, um, apart from the work that we do on the ground, there's also considering the larger agenda of the agency and seeing um, seeing more of the scope of work that what is happening globally. So the image of the right is showing one of the workshops, uh, one of the events that we had organized uh, for the World Urban Forum. So where we try to present our work to member states, to partners, to universities, to academia, to show them what is currently going on and the trends of what is happening and how they can come on board and uh, leverage those opportunities. But we also work on um, engaging with other private sector um, offices and studios to ensure that we are also learning from what they do. So in September we went to Copenhagen to have a master class with GEL architects to discuss public space projects, how we implement them, how we manage them and how to Im improve our opportunities to ensure that that is taken into account in the work that we do. I'll stop here and if there's any questions I can address later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Van. Uh, let me now invite Johannes, who graduated in 2012 and is with us today from Austria. Johannes. Hello. <clears throat> good afternoon to everyone in New York and uh, I guess good evening to everyone closer to my time zone or even ahead. Um, I'm curious uh, to see all the presentations and also discuss later on with you. Um, I myself uh, left New York in 2014 um, after um, working for two and a half years with Kate Orff at Escape Studio. Uh, we were mostly dealt with uh, post uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, measurements. Um, uh, since then, I've been focusing both in academia and in my professional practice uh, on uh, migration and social sustainability, both in urban and also in rural areas. So um, I'm going to show uh, five slides um, that are also split between what I do in the office uh, for urban design and architecture um, called uh, Studio Fleiss Drejowitz, based here in Vienna. Um, my uh, research and teaching uh, activities at uh, TU Vienna and also my independent practice where I'm going back and forth. Um, so this first uh, project um, is the result of an international competition where I was working as a project manager on behalf of, uh, of the office Studio Fly Strayowitz and, and really uh, think uh, re it reveals the impact uh, on the design has on the built environment but also on the regulatory framework. So we were challenging the status quo here 
uh, by actively proposing alternatives to the competition tender, uh, which asked for buildings in the flood prone zone. So we did the opposite. Uh, and the brief was to create a new creational space and an inundation zone of the River Danube. Um, um, the River Danube is crossing Vienna at the length that is comparable to uh, Manhattan, uh, the length of Manhattan. And we decided um, to move all the built structures, the new ones, but also existing ones above the 1,000-year uh, flood level and created uh, a radically urban beach that you can see here uh, at the top image. Um, we also introduced a term uh, called dynamic F FAR or dynamic uh, floor area. Um, that was basically a, a, a term or like a, a, an a measurement for uh, mobile street vendors and food trucks to, in order to uh, um, settle here in this um, vast um, beach area that is um, flood, fully floodable. Um, so we reconnected Vienna with its river um, and made it safely to access this water, uh, uh, but also accepted the reality of a flood protection system and make it perceivable for um, the residents of Vienna. Uh, the next project, when you go to the next slide, um, is uh, moving to academia. Um, this, it's called States of Refuge. And the primacy is here that not every problem can be addressed uh, uh, or will automatically lead uh, to a building or a master plan. Or, uh, so this is a long-term research project uh, that I'm doing with my uh, research partner Nina Kolvratnik uh, here at the TU. Uh, where we in investigate accommodation of, for asylum seekers in Austria. And we're also uh, critiquing with this project the role of the architects that, uh, or the role architects play of most often in these uh, um, environments. And we are to take on a passive role and uh, oftentimes execute uh, government initiatives. Uh, so we are advocating for an uh, active role that is addressing uh, needs uh, pertaining to housing, the right to self-determination, but also um, needs uh, regarding privacy and identity. Um, we are exploiting or critically exploit uh, the researching de design tool mapping uh, in this uh, project um, and establish an urgently needed research basis uh, for spatial practitioners wanting to become active participants in this uh, field of migration and asylum studies. And these findings um, that are can be seen here in multi-dimensional visualizations have the goal to bring uh, the invisible or unknown or the consciously hidden also, in this case, the depoliticized refugee uh, into the architectural but also public di discourse. Uh, all these mappings have been produced in a constant feedback loop with refugees uh, and the ultimate goal is to for the, also for them to regal, regain the public voice through participating in, in this project. Um, the next slide is moving to a, a built uh, project again, which I was working on behalf of uh, Studio Fly Stravitz again. Um, and starts uh, from the initial statement uh, that the majority of uh, our built environment uh, is in the a majority of our built environment in cities is made up of housing. Uh, so um, our um, starting point was how to create a, a city within a city. So if you want to change basically the city, you also have to change the way we live together, the way our residential uh, buildings look like. Um, and uh, this city within the city basically accommodates commercial spaces for microeconomies. Uh, also spaces for startups, apartments, of course, communal spaces, and also shared facilities. And these uh, highly flexible floors uh, on nine uh, floors um, uh, run in parallel with a research project uh, where we collaborate with sociolo sociologists, structural engineers, but also experts that conceived alternative financing strategies based uh, on solidarity, uh, solidarity between uh, market rate and uh, affordable units within that building itself. So it was quite a unique competition, again, an uh, architectural competition um, that not only asked for us to uh, uh, bring a concept to the table, but also bring already the users uh, to the table, even before the building was finished. 
uh, uh, almost four years ago. Uh, so between then and now, we had a lot of participatory pl planning sessions with the community, and we went all the way to detailing uh, this uh, building and the communal spaces. The one that you can see here in this slide is called uh, City Lodger, um, that is fitted with fully retractable uh, doors that are uh, normally used in fire brigade, brigade stations. Um, but what they do basically is to really connect the inside and the outside with each other. So public space becomes private and vice versa. Um, and even the paving pattern runs uh, into, the, into the building. So that this uh, line is definitely uh, completely blurred in this build building, this delimination between the public and the private. Um, next project is uh, called Silent Trails. When you click one, thank you. Um, and this is an investigation on the relationship between voluntary and involuntary migration networks uh, conducted in Northern Patagonia and Chile, uh, where I was also co-teaching a summer school on resilient coastal landscapes and wetlands last year. Um, this research project um, is addressing a cultural landscape in the border region of Chile and Argentina, Argentina a very inaccessible landscape or hard, very hard to access. Um, and it's a collaboration uh, with the Austral University of Chile in Valdivia. Um, we traced here a cultural landscape that is under constant change ever since it's uh, the start of the colonization uh, of this area. Um, and we did it through archival research and extensive field work, including GPS recordings, GIS-based analysis of satellite imagery, uh, then the chronolo chronological field samples and constructed these uh, mappings. Some of these uh, are excerpts here on the slide um, that show historic and recent migratory routes and settlements. And uh, through this mapping process, we also revealed the practice of deforestation by fire clearance, which made it possible for some of these uh, settlements to establish that later then disappeared again. Um, and um, we did it in cooperation with local landscape architects, forestry scientists, uh, and also historians. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is the last slide um, that um, is a party house in Greece. Um, it's a, still a, in a very, very early phase. It's a very sm much, sm much smaller scale. Um, the challenge here was to uh, uh, basically build a building within an olive grove without destroying the trees that have stood here for hundreds of years. Um, the programmatic and spatial composition uh, of these buildings uh, are the direct result of wind direction and sun position. Uh, and we really wanted to keep a productive landscape and combine it with, combine it with this domestic program. Um, while we also had to tackle um, problems like soil erosion, uh, that we are stabilizing with uh, native plants that have been cleared for agricultural reasons. And um, part of the uh, task is also to uh, in install and, and uh, design a drainage and water retention me measurements um, and produce a closed uh, water cycle again. And so the construction of this project is expected to start in the fall. And uh, that's it for now. And I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you so much, Johannes. That's great. Uh, we'll come back to questions later, but let me welcome Zarit to make her presentation, please. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here with all of you today. Um, I first want to start off by saying I know a lot of you are not at home. You're far away from your families, and it's a pretty scary time. So I just want to, you know, give everyone my best. I hope everyone's safe and healthy and everyone's families are well. I'm a little under the weather, and I have a little bit of a brain fog, so <laughs> forgive me for any, um, you know, whatever. But in the question and answer sec the se um, section, I'll be able to, you know, if you have any doubts about the work, I'll be able to get into it. So I'm going to start sharing my screen now, um, and I'll show you a little bit of my work. Let's see. So I am the founder of Territorial Empathy. Um, Territorial Empathy is a nonprofit design lab, and essentially what we do is um, we're a network of volunteers. Really, we're right now all over the world. 
and I've come together to advocate for the people in the places that are often overlooked. And the people that we really think about and kind of like our, our focus is around women, children, and migrants and displaced people. And this really came out of um, frustrations with the way that professional practice sometimes work. Um, so I, after the urban design program, I went to work at WXY, a firm here in New York City. And I was tapped to work on this project, the District 15 Diversity Plan. It's the first community-led um, racial integration plan um, dealing with public schools in New York. So I don't know if you guys are familiar, but New York City has the most segregated public schools in the country. Um, and that's something that I didn't really know about until I kind of took this project on. But it's really... Um, going through that experience was really eye-opening, just the inequality that we that people face every day just to, to get their kids a decent education. And part of that work since it was community led um, had, a, had a big community engagement component. So I spent almost a year traveling all over the city, um, but particularly uh, Brooklyn, talking to communities of color, talking to them about their needs um, to make sure that their voices were really included in this program. And what I found, through this work is that community engagement sometimes tokenizes communities of color. And, you know, we think about, you know, all of these like sexy words, inclusivity, um, you know, community-led engagement, et cetera. But what that really looks like, um, it, there's a huge gap from doing it well. And so there's language barrier, language barriers. There's so many different things that um, really, really affect communities of color. But I just, I got a little frustrated with the way that the project was being handled, not necessarily by the firm, but the way that communities of color were really being tokenized. Um, you know, they would get a native Spanish speaker to kind of, you know, um, they'd be put in these like gotcha journalism situations, et cetera, so that the plan would look inclusive. And that really frustrated me because understanding the data, understanding the, the situation, I, I, it made me angry that communities of color, the onus was on them. Um, and so that was also happening around the time of um, the election. And, you know, when, when all of these things happen, um, as a designer, as um, architects, we all have all of this amazing array of skills. We're storytellers, we can do so many different things that I decided that I'd, I'd really had enough. I, I, was, I wasn't happy with the way that things were being done. And I said, um, I'm gonna save up for a couple of months and I'm gonna leave and I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna figure something out and I'm gonna do good work for good people. And Territorial Empathy was really born out of this specific project, which I'll talk about briefly. And again, we can talk about, um, and accompany the salt. So this project specifically um, was really, the, the moment I started working on this project is when I finally decided to quit my job. And I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't keep ignoring things that were happening, knowing that I had the skills to do something to help. So I was having drinks with a friend one day and he was telling me, we were talking about the children that were separated at the border. And he was telling me that there, were, there was this facility where his friend worked here in New York, where these kids um, were being held. Um, and we've all seen the images and you know the terrible things. And he told me that his friend was really struggling with PTSD from just seeing these kids in these terrible conditions. And that there was this huge crisis of sexual assault in, in these facilities. The kids are being held, um, they're not separated by gender or ages. And the assault was often happening from the people that were in charge of taking care of them. And he said that to me and I, I just couldn't believe it. My heart stopped and I was like, you know, these kids are the perfect victims for, for assault. They're far away from home. They don't speak the language. They're vulnerable. And I said, how is no one talking about this? How can people just, you know, continue living their lives? Why isn't this a thing? And so I set up a Google alert that same day for any information on, di on this. I did research. I looked everywhere and I couldn't find any information. A couple of weeks later, because of that Google alert, I saw and that this representative from Florida, Ted Deutsch, had released this data set. Um, and I briefly, there were some pictures of that before. Um, and the data set here, let me go back. 
Um, this is what it looked like. And it said, basically, we've been doing a lot of research on the crisis of um, the children separated at the border. And we just found this treasure trove of documents documenting sexual assault. Um, and so one of the things that the Trump administration is doing uh, with any investigation, really, is that when there is a freedom for information request or something, they don't release digital records because they want to slow down investigations as much as possible. So one of the things that they're doing is that they literally get entrants to scan documents over and over again to make them almost impossible for text recognition to happen. And they just like bombard congressional offices with like stacks of paper. So it takes a while for people to get to the truth. And so he posted about this and he said, I can't, he was just fed up. He said, this is, this is incredible. Like, I can't believe that no one's doing anything about this. And I saw the data and he was like, you know, and those, you know, hundreds of pages of documents. And so when I saw that, I, I saw that, I said, well, I think there's something that we could do to help. There has to be, all of this information has directions. It has places, all of the reports explicitly say what happened with the assault. They say they, the cases have been investigated by the DOJ or the FBI. And I said, well, this is something that I can do. I can figure out a way to digitize this information and do something with it. So I reached out to um, Ted Deutsch. His office was wonderful. I said, listen, I'm so and so. I have these different skills. If you give me access to the state, I'll see what I can do about it. And they're like, great. You know, we don't have the tools to do it. We don't have the, the bandwidth. Here you go. Let's do something about it. So it really um, it really became this wonderful collaboration between both of us. And then um, I took all this information through machine learning and different tools. We're able to digitize it and create this dashboard that tells you in English and Spanish is exactly what happened. The, the whole picture of this assault and this abuse, where the kids are coming from, their gender, their ages, and then it, it ends up in a map showing where all the assaults have happened all over the country. And then you can click on one of the care centers and you can see the reports, what happened, a description, etc. And so this tool has been used by congressional investigators to advocate for these kids. And after having worked on this, I decided, you know what, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I, I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I know that the way that private firms sometimes run their projects, because everyone has special interests, because everyone has different agendas, um, are sometimes not the most honest, and they really don't have people's hearts and minds um, present at the forefront of the work. And so I said, well, then that means that it has to be a nonprofit. And then I started thinking, well, I don't, you know, I'm an architect and an urban designer. I don't know how to start a business. I don't know how to do any of these things. But I just knew in my heart that I couldn't keep having these things happen and not do anything about it when I knew that I had the tools to do it. And Territorial Empathy, we just had our first year um, celebration this last week. Um, it's a nonprofit organization by the IRS. And since that first project, we've been fortunate to work on so many different issues. Um, really, we've done projects around the world. We've, I've been able to travel. I've been able to do all these things that I never in my wildest dreams thought that I could do. And it really was all about putting people first, putting people's needs first, looking at the people that people forget about because they might not have the money to do the work that may not be able to speak the language to be like, hey, I need help. And so we've done work in Bogota, we've done work um, looking at going north and is one of the projects um, and it's really exciting. Um, this was looking at the relationship between climate change and um, migration from Central America. So when we think about our environment and we think about migration, you know, we know objectively that these things kind of go hand in hand. But we also know that there's so many vulnerable people and that people don't want to leave their homes. People don't want to leave their families. People don't want to immigrate illegally to the United States. And there's kind of this um, notion that, you know, people are gang members or whatever and all these things that get peddled in the media. But this really was investigative work to look at the dry corridor of the Northern Triangle region, which is in between Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. 
impacts and looking at drought and rainfall and then correlating that with migration, informal migration rates. Um, and so this project was going to be presented and uh, understand and risk by the World Bank in Singapore, but because of the crisis that's been delayed. Um, so I just want to go back to the home and I want to talk specifically about COVID-19. Um, one of the things that we've done because we have this amazing network of volunteers that are just so wonderful. Um, we have people in South Africa, we have people in uh, Lebanon, people that have just reached out to us from, from online or press or coverage that say, hey, I want to help. And I think that's been so beautiful. And I think that's something that I want you all kind of to, to, to know that when you're doing good work and your heart's in the right place, it's it's weird and I never thought this would happen, but it's a magnet and people want to support good work. People want to people want to help, they want to be inspired, and it's so beautiful. So one of the things we launched this week is our COVID-19 um, empathy grants. Essentially, we're doing pro bono work to anyone that's working with vulnerable communities um, or in specifically in the crisis and emergency services response area. Um, right now, because of this. We're currently working with the city of Syracuse to look at domestic violence. We're working with um, the Department of Education. We're on the task force to advise the chancellor and the mayor on how to make education, re remote education accessible, inclusive to communities of color. And it's just been really great. Um, and I think I just want to make a call to all of you, you know, in these times where everything seems so scary, we do have agency, we have so much agency. And this is kind of a cute little thing that we put together to just kind of thank the folks um, that do this work that are, um, we're just so impressed by and blown away. And a lot of them are people of color, the people that deliver your groceries, the people that, you know, there are so many vulnerable people that don't have the luxury of working from home. And so we put this little video together and you guys can go on the website and check it out. Um, I'm not going to play all of it, but essentially um, it's just celebrating people that are doing great work and we all can use these design tools. Um, and it was just like a little love letter that we put together to be like, you guys are the best and we're so proud of you. And this was our response to the UN call for um, global creatives to just bring awareness to, um, to the, the plight of people that are kind of going through all of this. And so um, I just want to start off by saying that, well, I want to end by saying that, um, you know, they always say, if you want to make God laugh, make plans. And I think the situation is so indicative of that. I never in my life ever thought that I'd be doing this work, but, um, and that people would support it or that, you know, that I, anything but it can be done and I especially encourage you know women it's so it you know imposter syndrome all of these things that happen you know I've shown up to meetings and have had people think that I'm the translator or the assistant or all of these different things but just to push through I mean we can really do anything when we put our mind to it and I never thought that this would be something that I would be doing, but it is, and we're just, I feel so blessed to be able to, to do this full time. This is now what I dedicate myself to full time, and it's really, truly a blessing. So I just encourage all of you to kind of, you don't have to know how to do it, but just, you know, one step at a time, and you are able to be entrepreneurs and creatives and align your values with your work. Thank you, thank you. Wow, wow, wow. This is amazing, Zarit, and everyone else who presented. It's just such amazing work that you all are doing. And we are so just thankful that you are all with us and our students here. Uh, so we have a few minutes to just quickly do some questions while we are still in this room before we break out and go into uh, separate rooms where each of our speakers will be able to speak to students um, more and uh, just a couple of questions. So some of the questions who are coming through are about, uh, you know, several, many of you have started your own firms and the students are asking, how do you find the funding? What kind of uh, uh, capital do you need to jump into starting your own, own company? And the questions were for Mansi. I don't know if she's still here because it's, there she is. It's past 1.30. Uh, AM for you. 
uh, and uh, uh, and then the other um, alumni who've also started their own firms can jump in. So why don't you start, Mansi? How did you find the capital and how much do you need? Um, so this was actually a question that I asked myself and my business partners that what is the kind of um, money target that you want to do at the end of the year since we were just three of us who started the firm. And the thing we realized is that you cannot have enough money capital to start but the but the first year's target was actually to find three other people who had a similar vision uh, and wanted to work with us and we did not I, I had a loan on my head uh, paying for my tuition I came back to India and I was paying that loan so we never did any work for free because I was still have had a lot of financial responsibilities but the target that you need is not capital. You need the kind of vision uh, and of the kind of firm that you want to start. And you definitely need the team. I think if you have the vision and the team, then you're good to go. And then everything will kind of fall in place. If you have your heart in place, like Zareth put it really well, is that uh, things work out in the weirdest ways if you just keep pushing in the right direction. So that's that's my answer to that johannes do you want to add to that well i guess there's uh, again two pair of shoes uh, when it comes to academia um we have in in the austrian uh, example is very specific because we have we have funding through universities but we also have a lot of grants of course for doing this research uh, but we're also actively like looking for sponsors and like third party uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, donors, if you will, but also sponsors who want to sponsor a publication. So uh, that has been like a growing uh, amount uh, that uh, um, that also consumed a gr more time uh, of, of what we what we've been doing to sort of look for for third party uh, money, so to say. Um, and um in regarding to to starting basically also uh, your, your own firm um i think um it needs um of course a uh, dedication of um and and time um and uh depends uh on what kind of, again on what kind of projects you're you're working on and and how big how big your team is um what what sort of uh, of, of what sort of plan you, you're you're making? What sort of business plan you're looking at? Um, so um, I guess in in my case, um, it, I'm uh, looking uh, at uh, I have a, I have team teams that assemble per, per project by project. So it's like not like an an office that is like continu continuously running. Um, and because I have the academia, I also work. Uh, at the professional practice uh, as, as a project manager. Um, so Thank you. That was Thank my setup. You. That's great. Yeah, I think balancing with academia is very interesting. Zarith already talk, talked about how she found funding for what she did. And uh, Milton, do you want to give a uh, um, half a minute answer to how you found money, especially for your collaborative? Yeah, I think I, I agree with him, what the man, Nancy, Nancy said that uh, it, it was more about the interest and the team was the capital. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, sharing the same interest, that was really the capital other than having just funds to establish an office here in LA, Copenhagen, Singapore, and Bogota. It was more the capital join the to show, you know, in order to qualify for these applications initially as with the Inter-American Development Bank. It was just a previous experience, of course, that was the capital, right, the background. But uh, we were bigger as a group, as a team. Mm -hmm. So that was really the capital, the team. Mm -hmm. And we didn't plan it to be, you know, all over the world. It was, oh, okay, my brother is in Bogota, I'm from Bogota, I'm in LA, Pedro moved from New York to Copenhagen, and then this other friend now in Singapore. We didn't really plan it that way. It was just the team was the capital, initially, mm -hmm. and it will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of you had some kind of a strategic plan. You found the partnerships and then you were able to run with it, which is great. Uh, Kaya, and there were some other questions. Yeah, I, I wanted to, keep, to, to maybe transition the conversation to a, another sort of uh, 
theme of questions that were around skills, right? And um, I think Nina asked it very directly, Ban, how do you, you know, what kind of skills did you need or how did you market them to um, working for someone like you in Habitat? But maybe we can also open this up to everyone as sort of suggestions of how does what, um, what we're doing now in the UD program, the kinds of skills and the, the way of thinking translates into something that you want to continue, call it market or, or communicate to potential collaborators, clients or employers in the future. Ban, do you want to start with you and Habitat? Yeah, sure. Um, I think at that point, uh, as Zareth had said earlier, we are great storytellers and we pick up a lot of skills through the urban design program on telling a story through our visuals, through our elevator pitches, through our presentations. So I think that's a very strong skill that um, can be desirable to many of the agencies because you're able to narrate all the thoughts and link them together to come up with a compelling storyline for people, um, for donors, for private sector to all to understand and see where you're coming from. So I think that was very str a strong uh, skill that I think uh, can be highlighted, um, as well as in terms of your visualization and how you visualize the data that you have, you analyze it and you show it to support your story. I think also one of the key um, skills and components that have transferred into my work right now and based on what I learned from uh, the urban design program was on the community engagement and participation component. I'm sure a lot of you in the um, through your global travels but also, also through the fall semester and the summer semester you've had to engage with community members, discuss with them and try to understand their challenges and their opportunities and how you can um, engage them in that sense. So I think that is also an a skill for you and an opportunity for you to see, to, to highlight that you're able to speak to people, to engage to different stakeholders at different levels. So that's also another two, two set of skills that I can highlight for now. Thank you. And Emily, I see you've been already pretty active in responding in the chat, but do you want to um, expand on this maybe a little bit about who you're actually pitching to and um, and what kind of skills are relevant for work at DOT? Sure, I mean, Ban really well said about um, stakeholders and storytelling skills. I think something that I've seen over the years is you can have a perfect pitch and you can have an amazing idea and it just falls flat if you don't know who actually needs to be hearing it and you don't actually pitch it um, at the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we also know who we're pitching to, but because they are distracted with something else, I mean, it's something we're experiencing right now. We have a city government in New York that is, um, you know, dealing with uh, kind of the, the largest um, group of uh, infected uh, people and deaths. And so it becomes incredibly difficult to pitch kind of second and third tier solutions, which the city needs, but um, you know, when, when, the, um, when the decision makers are so distracted with something else, it becomes you know, incredibly difficult to get a good message across. So I would also just say perseverance, um, you know, continuing, to, um, continuing to push, continuing to refine your pitch is just incredibly important because it falls flat once or twice doesn't mean um, again, it's a bad idea. So um, I'm still pitching ideas. I've been pitching for years um, and, and I have seen things move, you know, five years later um, when, when the time is right. So just encourage perseverance. What other skills are you looking for? Um, who can we, uh, how about Milton? Do you wanna speak to that? Yes, I think uh, I think for recent graduates, something that is important when you show your fantastic, uh, good presentations in your design portfolio, I think that is important that uh, any office will see is that your 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 projects had a base, the data that you show where where the proposal comes from, you know where where are the data they support in your project, and where you can speak about it. You know, I think that's important when you, you know, get in an interview, in an interview with a designer or a urban design office or architecture office, the way you support your projects with content, the data, where the ideas came from. It's a tip, I believe. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. I think we want to sort of conclude the official part of this event. Um, so Shmita will explain to us how we all move into smaller rooms and smaller conversations for those of you who want to in the next couple of minutes. Um, and thank you, big, big, big thank you to all our speakers. So inspiring. Um, also really inspiring to hear what urban designers can do right now other than sitting in front of their screens at home um, and uh, really be involved or from their screens at home, I should say, right? Thanks a lot. Um, Sushmita, I'll kick it over yeah, to Yeah, I you. just want to say that uh, that uh, we are uh, very respectful of the time of our speakers. So um, we expect you to be there as long as the speakers are able to, if they are able to. And uh, of course, our students will know not to stretch their hospitality too much. And uh, also feel free to change the room. Speakers can also um, change rooms. So Sushmita, why don't you describe how that works? Yeah, so we have six breakout rooms, one for each of the alumni and panelists. And uh, the students will be pre-assigned to these rooms in the beginning. And you can always break out from the room to come to the main room in order to switch to any of the other panelists' rooms. And I can um, facilitate that. Okay, big, big thank you. Big applause to everyone.